Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, uh, respected colleagues and guests. Welcome to this month's Ummatics Colloquium. My name is Hannah Aisha and I'm Outreach Coordinator at Ummatics. And as always, we're happy to welcome our returning attendees and those of you who are joining us for the first time. Uh, we're looking forward to a productive discussion ahead, inshallah, with our insightful guest speakers today. Today's colloquium is entitled Coping with the Modern State. The surrender of the Muslim world and thus articulations of religious authority to the nation state paradigm since the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate is a subject of much discussion and scholarship. Examined from a multitude of theological, political and historical perspectives, the trajectory of Islamic authority in the modern world is analyzed often in isolation. Its exceptionalist qualities are highlighted and the establishment of national Islamic affairs ministries are evaluated. The role played by the Diyanet in Turkey, the ministries of Awqaf and Islamic affairs across North Africa and the Middle East, Jakim in Malaysia, and scholarly councils across the Muslim world are vigorously debated, particularly in relation to their influence on public religiosity, their success in legitimizing themselves as sources of Islamic leadership, and their relationship to their respective states. However, in his recent book, Coping with Defeat, Sunni Islam, Roman Catholicism and the Modern State, Professor Jonathan Lawrence juxtaposes the trajectory of Islam with arguably its closest religious counterpart, the Catholic Church, exposing striking parallels with their changing relationship to the modern state. This important work presents a historical panorama of the Islamic and Catholic political religious empires and how they responded to three major shocks religious reformation, the rise of the nation state, and mass migration. It argues that whereas Islam, early Christianity and Islam were both initially characterized by missionary expansion, religious institutions forged in the modern era are primarily defensive in nature. And just as Catholic institutions eventually accepted the state's political jurisdiction and embraced transnational spiritual leadership as their central mission, Professor Lawrence reveals an analogous process unfolding across the Sunni Muslim world in the 21st century. Among his findings is that the de-establishment of Islam, namely doing away with Islamic affairs ministries in the Muslim world, would harm, not help, with reconciliation to the rule of law. Examining upheavals in geography, politics, and demography, coping with defeat considers how centralized re religions cope with the loss of prestige making it the perfect stimulant for our discussion today. Professor Lawrence's book was published in 2021 by Princeton University Press, and so of course can be read in full for our interested listeners, but he has kindly submitted the opening pages which outline the book's central argument for our colloquium members, and this will have been sent to you all via email. Uh, Jonathan Lawrence is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Clough Center for Constitutional Democracy at Boston College. His principal areas of teaching and research are comparative politics and religion in Western Europe, Turkey and North Africa. He is also the author of The Emancipation of Europe's Muslims, published in 2012. Our event today will start with Professor Lawrence presenting his paper for about 25 minutes, followed by two respondents, as usual, who will speak for 10 minutes each, uh, and then we will open the floor to audience participation. Our first respondent for today is Dr. Oymir Anjum. Dr. Anjum is the Imam Khattab Endowed Chair of Islamic Studies at the University of Toledo, and of course, the, the founder of the Umatics Project. Uh, our second respondent for today is Dr. Abdullah Al Aryan. Uh, Dr. Abdullah is Associate Professor of History at Georgetown University in Qatar. He is the author of Answering the Call, Popular Islamic Activism in Sadat's Egypt, published in 2014 by Oxford University Press. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Professor Lawrence, uh, as our first speaker, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Thank you to all who are here for having me uh, as, your, as your guest. Uh, I'm so pleased to, to learn about the Umatix project and colloquium. It's something I wish I had known about when I was writing my book, uh, because it, I, I think I would I stand to learn a lot from all of you. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, let me share my screen and begin. Oh, sorry, I do need to ask your permission to share screen. 
Okay, no problem. Hopefully, uh, Bethana will be working on that on the technical side or, or Okay, hopefully Great. those permissions should have been altered. So. so the talk that I'm presenting today covers uh, part of the ground uh, in the new book that um, was so uh, kindly introduced just now. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here to be able to discuss it. Uh, it could seem like we have entered a bit of a time warp uh, in recent months uh, with both Al-Qaeda and Salman Rushdie and the Taliban again dominating news cycles. However, I would argue that a century now after Afghan independence from Great Britain and now one year after the US military withdrawal that in fact, we have seen what I would call a definitive rearrangement of the old colonial puzzle. Now, to the horror of many, the Taliban have been slowly implementing their model society. To the satisfaction of others, they are thus reviving the first Islamic caliphate since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Having defeated foreign military occupation, which both Al Qaeda and ISIS failed to do, the Islamic Emirate is now the highest profile Sunni retort to the Shia revolution in Iran. Now, there is no Islamic consensus on the necessity of such a polity, but its persistence throughout Islamic history is unavoidable. The de facto existence of a Sunni caliphate today closes what is a 150 year bracket of Western intervention against just such a thing. Now, one need not approve of the Taliban regime to recognize its place in history. Now, I argue that the Taliban's position atop the heap of pretenders is actually the ironic outcome of a 19th century campaign against the Ottoman Caliphate. In that period, the British sought to decouple over 100 million Muslim subjects across North Africa, the Middle East, India, and Afghanistan from their ties to Ottoman Islam. This was also true of the French, Dutch, Russian, and Austrian empires, which as you can see here, were also home to tens of millions of the world's Muslims. Now, Fearing the caliph's influence as the lone independent Muslim power of the era, these colonial empires severed all ties to Istanbul's spiritual leadership in favor of their preferred local alternatives. In the case of India, colonial officials worked to replace the caliph in Friday prayers and to substitute the Turkish fez with the local turban. In this case, it created breathing room for Deoband seminaries like the Darul Uloom from 1866, which was an Anglo-Muslim college chartered for Indian and Afghan ulama that sought to turn their loyalty away from the Turkish Sultan Caliph and towards Her Majesty's government. But the Darul Uloom proved mu much more popular than the Anglo-Muslim uh, uh, college. Contemporary US observers will certainly recognize a pattern of unintended consequences across the former British Empire. In the Middle East, London promised Arab sovereignty and committed to transferring Islam's holy cities to Arab hands. Once liberated from Ottoman rule, however, the cities actually fell to unintended successors. In Jerusalem, the British created a new independent position of Mufti. But when their man died suddenly, he was replaced by his brother, who later allied with Nazi Germany. The installation of British ally Hussein bin Ali as sovereign over Mecca and Medina also did not last long before he was ousted by the Saudi royal family and Wahhabi fundamentalists. In response, although the, the Sultan Caliphs of the late Ottoman Empire could never claim 
universal appeal, Abdul Hamid and his successors built the largest network of mosques, charities, seminaries, and ulama that was ever assembled. In my book, I discuss how this effort resembled the Catholic counter-reformation following the loss of spiritual authority in Northern Europe. So the analogy is being drawn between the uh, evolution of Protestant national churches in Northern Europe and the European occupation of the former Ottoman Empire and other Muslim lands and installing their own preferred national and local religious leadership. Now, the Ottoman spiritual leadership targeted audiences that lived almost entirely outside Ottoman borders. This outreach was global, it was religiously moderate and modernizing, and it embraced new technologies from train travel to photography and the telegraph, all to help enhance the growing international profile of the Ottoman Sultan Caliph. Soon after being expelled from Islam's holiest sites by the British and others, however, the Caliphate was terminated abruptly. It was Turkish statesmen like Ataturk who pulled the trigger, but it was European occupation around the Sunni world from North Africa to India to Java that had already hollowed out the institution of caliph for the many tens of millions of Muslims under their rule. Now, non-Arab Muslim voices, such as the Indian Khilafa movement, were displeased because of their attachment, which had been cultivated over time to the Sultan Caliph. And many Arab Muslims, in turn, felt betrayed <clears throat> by Great Britain's fleeting interest in their cause. The British toppled one caliphate without guaranteeing the rise of another. And so the book would argue that it's no accident that the enduring brotherhoods of international political Islam first blossomed in India and in Egypt, where the British launched their assault upon the caliphate. For nearly a century now, the book argues, Islam's international status has continued to pay a steep price for the external intervention by the European colonial empires. It argues that the caliphate's absence is a central reason for the ensuing communal strife, including the spread of religiously motivated violence. The missing caliphate has trapped Muslim communities in a purgatory that is populated by transnational pretenders on the one hand, and state-appointed ulema and national ministers of Islamic affairs on the other. Today, more than half of the world's Muslims reside in countries where Islam is partly or fully established, that is to say, under state control, with few or no private Islamic spaces permitted outside of the home. That is, they are without independent religious society, civil society. This is the case where I did almost all of my field work in Turkey and North Africa. So I am limited in my scope because of the uh, limited number of cases that I uh, could visit um, individually. But this, was, this, was, this is the, the argument of the book. And so each of the ministry's religious legitimacy in each of these post-independent nation states is frequently contested by non-governmental movements. And those non-governmental movements include elections-oriented movements, including the Muslim Brotherhood, as well as violent rivals, um, such as Al-Qaeda or the once uh, uh, so-called Islamic State. Now, to make an imperfect analogy, the book argues that terminating the Ottoman Caliphate and forcing the last Caliph's flight from Dolmabache Palace left the Muslim world in the throes of the Islamic equivalent of the Roman question. That was the period after the unification of Italy, when the Pope was almost entirely deprived of territorial sovereignty 
for the first time in over a millennium. Now, after decades of opposition to democratization and trying to stop the separation of church and state in Catholic Europe, the Vatican was isolated militarily, politically, diplomatically. Outside of its walls, its clergy and religious leadership endured heavy-handed intervention. At the heights of anti-clericalism, the European governments cut off the national hierarchies from Rome. They required loyalty affirmations from priests and bishops, and they strictly limited the activities of churches. Now this top-down state control of internal appointments and the dispossession of church holdings is analogous to the situation of Islam across much of the Muslim world today. The main distinction with Islam is that the Vatican walls were never breached and the Pope was allowed to remain in Rome. This ultimately would open the door to resolving Catholicism's place in the international order, which required ultimately including the Vatican as an equivalent counterpart in that system. That is allowing for somewhere on earth, the existence of a polity under sovereign papal rule, the sovereign rule of God's shadow on earth. Now the creation of Vatican City was not a silver bullet, bullet that resolved all state church conflict, but it granted the church a spiritual afterlife in the nation state era. The papacy remained an anti-democratic force for decades, but it was no longer at war with the emerging political order. European governments gradually restored organizational independence to Catholic officialdom. In one country after another, the church won back autonomy over its internal affairs in the course of the 20th century, including clerical training, bishop nominations, even in countries that had banned the hierarchy, sometimes for centuries. Now, the soft restoration was made possible, I argue, by the creation of the Vatican city state. In one country after another, the soft restoration reverted control over religious matters from state oversight towards independently appointed community leaders despite the existence of foreign ties to the Vatican. And this was possible because the vanquishing of the Pope's temporal power left the papacy in place. The Pope has hundreds of millions of followers and admirers, but he governs over fewer than 1,000 citizens. This, I would argue, was increasingly the case of the Ottoman Sultan Caliphs as well towards the end of the Caliphate when it was terminated. No such bridge, of course, to the past has been projected on the Mediterranean's southern and eastern banks. Following the last caliph's exile, Saudi and Turkish governments, for their own reasons, sought to prevent the nomination of a successor at international conferences that were held in Jerusalem and Cairo, thus ensuring that the caliph's seat would remain empty. Now, the absence of a consensual ruler to receive the Ummah's pledge of loyalty and benediction has left the basic premise of state legitimacy open for debate in much of the Muslim world. In other words, who grants validity to whom? Religion or state? Now, we know that Al-Qaeda and ISIS have offered their views, now it's the Taliban who are offering an answer to that question. And the Taliban, of course, are ruling over 40 million citizens in a land that is twice the size of Germany. Governments across the region will continue, surely, to monitor developments very attentively. Because as you can see from this slide, they have had national ministries of Islamic affairs that have been strengthened, I show, at certain critical moments uh, in the history of their national independence. And they are used to, by this time, protecting their citizens from foreign religious influences. 
This has included, for example, unwanted Shia proselytism in the late 1970s, undesired Wahhabi proselytism in the 1990s and afterwards. Um, and some of that influence has, of course, led to political violence or terrorism and sometimes even civil war. Now, the bureaucracies that I describe at length in, in, in my book, I try to explain where they, where they come from and how they've evolved, they can seem unnatural at first, um, but when you look at it closely in the context of uh, where these nation states uh, are in their state religion relationship, the Islamic services they provide meet a basic public demand for prayer space and religious education and the basic rights of prayer, birth, marriage, death. And I've come to think of these Islamic affairs agencies or ministries as ministries of spiritual self-defense. And to forego them, to disestablish religion, would be the equivalent right now of unilateral disarmament. Now, the book explores the analogy between uh, the ministries of Islamic affairs and the evolution of of, of uh, defense ministries and, 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 and the military and tries to make an argument for uh, essentially uh, the independent administration of religious affairs that falls under civilian oversight, but which however, like the military enjoys its own set of privileges of self-governance from matters of justice to matters of formation. Now, I show how religious spending and public policies towards Islam have varied significantly. Not all of the ministries of Islamic affairs were created equal. The 20th century secularist governments did not all leave behind conditions that could actually produce a national core of ulama and imams. So in the 21st century, there are essentially two echelons in the cases that I examine most closely through fieldwork and, and archives. Um, and in one echelon stand Turkey and Morocco on the one hand, and in the other, uh, uh, Algeria and Tunisia. And this is uh, a reflection of, of state spending. And of course, I try to show in, in the chapters um, a reflection also of bureaucratic attitudes um, towards uh, Islam's place in, in, in national identity. Now, here you can see the typical uh, duties of Islamic affairs uh, ministries. Uh, they um, uh, essentially take care of the, the infrastructure for uh, uh, prayer, for education, and of course, also for training the, the, the scholars and, and religious leaders. And I try to show in the book that where um, prayer leaders are better funded and where they have had more mosques and basic religious educational resources, that governments have actually been readier against certain spikes in, in, in the transnational threats that they are trying to um, repel. And, and obviously sometimes that includes legitimate political activity, but sometimes it also includes uh, uh, you know, potentially seditious or violent, um, violent transnational um, uh, movements that attack, uh, you know, governments or, or citizens. So I argue that policies that purposefully downplayed religion in the 20th century, that shuttered the ceremonies, that closed the mosques, that left inadequate prayer leadership, that they essentially left citizens vulnerable to um, other movements. Now there is, of course. Uh, still excessive state control that too often permeates religious content and personnel decisions uh, emanating from uh, the National Council of Ulama down to uh, the Quran courses in the neighborhood mosque. Uh, so there is a repressive side to this, as, as I just mentioned, uh, which uh, comes along with enforcing this uh, uh, monopoly over any union of religion and politics. Um, here you can see some of uh, the recent investments being made in North Africa in particular. Now, 
to achieve the neutral administration and devolution of Islamic affairs in the long term, as was accomplished for Roman Catholicism, Muslim states will need to exit this current state of what I describe as subjective state oversight. And that will mean more devolution of, of religious uh, powers, including locally elected mufti, lo uh, elected ulema, uh, more uh, of what I call soft restoration of you know, rights to, to, to carry out marriages, to resolve disputes in, in family law, um, uh, inheritance, et cetera. Uh, for now, Muslim majority governments like Turkey will use their considerable resources to block any efforts at, for example, Talibanization. And they will continue to promote the internal policies that have helped ease their own state Islam conflicts. Now, in the book, I, I also spend a bit of time uh, discussing Turkey's international role as a defender of Islam over the past 15 years which has led to a surge in its leadership's popularity across the greater Middle East. And, uh, and I try to attribute uh, the international popularity of, of Erdogan, ironically, you know, he's not obviously a, a cleric of any kind, but uh, the international popularity, uh, I, I try to tie this towards Ankara's leadership in Jerusalem, as well as its worldwide delivery of external aid to Muslim populations around the world that have enhanced this profile, recalling, in a sense, uh, a lot of the, the, the late Ottoman uh, uh, outreach. Um, internally, however, in Turkey, as in Tunisia and other democratizing countries uh, uh, across the Muslim world, Tunisia is obviously not still democratizing at present, the religious rebalancing that followed hardcore secularism is still very much a work in progress. And I, uh, I leave you here with uh, an image of these national ministries, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Um, I look forward to your comments and, and your questions, and I, I hope to have been um, at least uh, a little bit clear in, in conveying what is uh, a somewhat uh, complex uh, argument. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lawrence. Um, it was definitely a really, really interesting uh, and insightful presentation. Uh, we will come back to you as well uh, after hearing from our respondents, just if you would like to respond to any of uh, any of the points that they make. But and and until then, first we'll go to our first respondent, who is not Dr. Anjum, it's um, Dr. Al Arian. Um, feel free to um, uh, take, take take the floor, Dr. Al Arian. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, and uh, thank you to Oimer for um, the invitation to be with you all here today. And um, to Dr. Lawrence, I want to uh, commend you for your work on the study. It's a really uh, impressive work that I think is really grand in its scope, and yet it's also very meticulously researched. It's very rich with a lot of empirical detail. I think it poses a lot of really ambitious uh, questions and engages them in in a very impressive kind of comparative uh, fashion that spans both long periods of time as well as geographic boundaries. Um, and yet it also manages to delve very deeply into the chosen case studies that we see here offering a wealth of information in support of its arguments. Um, so the central question of the study, the way that I understood it, concerns how traditional religious institutions that were wedded to imperial systems of governance which were both lending them legitimacy while also maintaining some degree of sovereignty in, in and of themselves, confronted the dismantling of those systems of governance, which undid to some degree the demands for religion-based legitimacy, and then totally eroded in the process any sovereignty that these institutions had historically enjoyed. And so, of course, we know the argument is structured around those the three major events, the shocks, uh, as they're called. Um, and I think they're all, they're all very interconnected. And at the same time, I think the periodization here works quite well in showcasing the different ways that each one of these uh, presented unique challenges that resulted in different outcomes. In the evolving bargain that resulted, religious institutions strengthened other elements, especially beefing up their institutional structures and professionalization of the personnel involved. Um, so I thought I would offer some observations and questions that came up for me while I was reading 
um, that came from my own reading of many of these historical events and also as a scholar who looks specifically at Islamic political and social movements um, and have looked at a lot of these same developments, but maybe from a different perspective or a different side, um, and especially considering some of these more recent currents. And so I guess I would say that my comments will, will run along two different tracks. The first being thinking specifically about the reading of that history. Um, and the second being in terms of the outcomes or the implications of our reading of that history in, in terms of some of the more recent um, development. So I guess first I'd like to engage a bit with some of the assumptions surrounding the idea of religious hierarchies of the Ottoman imperial state. And I, and I thought this was a really fascinating part of the argument because so much of what we often hear about the impact, the devastation of the collapse of the Khilafah, of the Caliphate, really concerns much more its symbolic importance its emotional ties, and less, we hear far less about the kind of institutional or structural um, outcomes of the collapse of, of the caliphate in terms of what this really meant on the ground, so to speak, in terms of how Islam was actually lived and, and experienced um, in all the kind of depth of the empire. And I think to that extent, this is where I really had kind of some of my initial questions. So putting, of course, aside the, the case of Turkey for a moment, because of course, this was the, the it was very uniquely placed as the capital and actual heartland of the empire. I thought that the choice of the three North African states was really interesting because historically they were always seen as kind of quite peripheral uh, in terms of their position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the empire. And so the collapse of the Ottoman state as a state was probably uh, least felt in North Africa, where Algeria and Tunisia, of course, had already been firmly under French colonial control. Morocco had more recently come under French occupation. Um, this isn't, of course, to say that there wasn't still a traumatic uh, impact in terms of the, you know, the impact it had on believers across this entire region, but rather just to say that the structure and daily life of Islamic law, practice, observance, were not really that heavily dependent on some kind of centralized Ottoman religious bureaucracy that was based in Istanbul. For one thing, of course, we know that the bulk of the legal practice in North Africa adhere to the Maliki legal school rather than the Hanafi school that was preferred by the Ottomans, which meant that the centers of training, instruction in the religious sciences were likely to be quite localized. Um, and then, of course, on the political level, we know that even prior to the colonial intervention, um, that there was still a, a sense that the North African states were thought to have only loose and, and just kind of very formal control uh, or at least affiliation with the Ottoman state, with most political appointments really occurring on the local level. So these were kind of very loose um, frontiers or borders of, or boundaries of the Ottoman state. Um, and so the idea of kind of associating major structural collapse of the Ottoman state with what was happening locally, I think, in North Africa, um, I'm kind of you know wondering in terms of how we can draw those, those exact conclusions. Tunisia, for instance, already had a constitutional revolution and implemented it well earlier in, in the middle of the 19th century. And so it was well on its way to kind of constructing what we might consider to be the modern Tunisian um, state. And so a, re a related point concerns the role and influ influence of Islamic revivalist trends that existed beyond the bounds of the Ottoman state that I, I really believed deserved uh, greater acknowledgement here. Um, and so we think about the 18th and 19th century. And again, this is sort of coming from maybe my own interests, but I think of, of this time period um, being replete with examples of religious revivalist movements that challenged both Ottoman and colonial control and offered an alternative model of state building rooted in Islamic norms and claims to legitimacy. And so this extends, for instance, beyond the kind of the obvious example of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in Eastern Arabia, because of course we see that that's the project that continues to exist in, in different form today. But it also includes a number of, of Sufi currents. So thinking about the Qadiriya, which gave rise to the Emir Abdel Qadir, who led the resistance against the French invasion of Algeria, building up an independent state in the process, and then later, of course, helping to confront the destructive sectarian violence during his exiled years in Syria. There's the Sunusiya Tariqa in Libya, which played a critical role in anti colonial resistance and also gained formal recognition from the Ottoman Sultan, though, of course, it maintained basically effective autonomy. There's, a, there's the example of the Mahdiya movement in Sudan, on the other hand, which declared war on both the British as well as the Ottoman Egyptian state alike. And despite its short-lived status, the Mahdi, of course, continues to exist as a major intellectual current that's deeply rooted in Sudanese identity, society, and politics ever since. So the point here is just to show that there are limits to the reach of the Ottoman state and its religious institutions, and to complicate the picture a little bit by pointing to alternative institutions, currents, 
and forms of religious instruction, identification, and practice that were far less dependent on any kind of centralized state structure. So the, by the time we get to the period of interest to us here, that is the emergence of the modern nation state and its determination to regulate religion as a discrete category informed by the limits and ambitions of the state, it's important to note that what is being replaced here is not only the former or the formal rather hierarchical structures imposed by the centralized institutions of the Ottoman state, but rather every other localized expression of religious belief and practice, which were in many ways more relevant to the lives of most people in the territories in question. And so I suppose this is where I have some questions about some of the conclusions then that are drawn um, by the analysis. And so to suggest that nation state Islam was, was a necessity born of the urgency to replace collapsed Ottoman imperial institutions with national religious institutions, I think invites us to delve more deeply into what is the state that is being described here and what is the Islam that it is purporting to establish. I do think that the analysis is quite impressive and helpful in pouring over a wide array of state records spanning things like the construction of mosques, the number of religious endowments, the expansion of religious education programs, the number of preachers, imams and the like, but I do think we also have to look not just at the process of institutionalization, but also in terms, uh, not just the structure, but also the substance or the content um, of these institutions. And so the state that emerges out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire and the legacy of European colonialism is one that was maintained and dominated by nationalist elites steeped in Western liberalism who viewed traditional religious institutions with deep suspicion, if not outright hostility. In most cases, those elites eventually gave way to an emergent class of more radical nationalists who are more deeply anti-colonial yet no less westernized than their predecessors, embodied in movements such as the Ba'ath Party, Nasserism, or even Bourguiba's Socialist Distorian Party. These states were deeply authoritarian and insofar as they maintained any religious bent, were more interested in subduing the role of Islam as it was traditionally un understood from informing many matters of state and public life to fulfilling only basic ritual needs or narrow matters of law governing merited, marriage and inheritance, while eradicating for Islam any other social, let alone political, role. Which brings us to the Islamists. So examining the development and evolution of this trend over the past century, I think complicates the picture somewhat. I recognize that it's not the focal point of the study, but I, I certainly noticed that there seemed to be at times a tendency to flatten all expressions of non-state Islam as being kind of radical, extremist, militant, violent, conflating movements like the Islamic State with movements like Tunisia and Nahda, which of course have a far different and more complex critique of nation state Islam. And I, and I would acknowledge that chapter nine, I think corrects this a lot. So by the time we get to, to uh, the ninth chapter, I think there's a much more complicated picture there. But until then, I think all of the references to sort of everything that is not the sort of monolithic state Islam is kind of often seen in this very adversarial um, way as just kind of being an enemy of the state, irrespective of sort of its aims, its ideology, its beliefs, etc. Um, so that would certainly be the authoritarian state's position regarding unauthorized interpretations of the Islamic tradition, but it is one that has been repressive and self-serving. Islamist currents, particularly those that have internalized the realities of the nation state model of political organization, have not objected to the proliferation of religious institutions and personnel by the regimes in much of the Arab world, but rather their critique has been in the form that these institutions have taken, advancing a narrow and disempowering interpretation of the faith meant to elicit political quietism and total obedience to repressive regimes. Moreover, by distilling the faith down to a handful of ministries and offices that pale in comparison to the rest of the instruments of governance, there was also identified a clear determination to create silos of religious belief and observance that remain separate from the demands of everyday life. The fact, for instance, that there are agencies dealing with religious education that are separate and distinct from those that deal with standard education is found in national schools and universities, I think is just one small measure of how these states view the role of Islam in their societies. And critiques put forward by the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood and advanced by sister movements across the Arab region maintained the challenges confronting Muslim societies was not that their states had fully disavowed their Islamic identity, but rather that they had repurposed it to suit narrow authoritarian goals. The nationalization of an Azhar, which had maintained its independence from the state for nearly a thousand years, occurred not under the government of Muslim Brotherhood's Muhammad Morsi, but during the regime of Gamal Abdel Nasser. If anything, Morsi's uh, Freedom and Justice Party was debating the possibilities of restoring to an Azhar its former 
independence. And as Rashid al Ghanoushi has said upon Nahda's first electoral victory in Tunisia in 2011, the movement's goal is not to impose Islam from the state, but rather to liberate Islam from the state. In fact, the political choices expressed on the part of millions of citizens across the Arab world during the short-lived post-authoritarian transitions may permit us to pause and question the effectiveness of decades of nation-state Islam as a force whose goals were only achieved on the surface and under extreme duress. This is not to suggest that Islamists don't wish to utilize the powers of the state to enforce their own interpretations of the Islamic tradition, but rather that many of these movements see their role first and foremost as a liberatory force that reimagines the role of the state in doing so. And given their vast experience working within society, considers the possibility that at least part of the responsibility for the enactment of these practices rests with civil society. Taking these critiques into account, I think, helps us look at the state-sanctioned policies implementing its own vision of Islam in a slightly different light. And so I'll just leave it there because I know that uh, we're running low on time. But thank you so much again. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Abdullah. Um, and yeah, time is, time is perfect. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, uh, Professor Lawrence, we will come back to you, but let's just uh, hear from uh, Dr. Anjum first. Go ahead, Dr. Anjum. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Thank you very much once again, uh, Professor Lawrence, for uh, writing this really amazing and rich text and one that has kept uh, me thinking and I know many other people that I have talked to thinking for a while and I think it will remain an important book in the field. I'm already teaching it and planning to teach it in my uh, graduate seminar. Um, uh, and also thank you, uh, Professor al for um, a really um, thoughtful analysis based on uh, your deep knowledge of the history of the region. Um, and both in your admiration for the book and in your questions about the book, I agree. So I will change tax here and I will uh, reflect only on some theoretical, philosophical implications of the book. In other words, how the text um, seems to me to fit in, in terms of its theory. And to some degree, you could argue that mine would be a, a more contrapuntal uh, reading uh, that is trying to read the text as um, perhaps uh, against the author's intention in order perhaps just to be provocative and, uh, and, and, and invite uh, reflection. So let me begin by saying, um, one of the things I admired about the book is, is that it is a big think. Um, it reminded me of uh, Samuel Huntington's style, big theory, but I mean that in the best way, because I think Huntington, while in many ways thinking about the clash of civilizations, um, has proven right, or at least as right as a political theorist can be in many respects. Nevertheless, it's also hard to um, av avoid the feeling that his book, um, when you look at the details, was mean-spirited, meaning it was a book that invited and, and theorized and almost uh, in, in, encouraged a clash Professor uh, Lawrence's book is quite the opposite. It, in fact, is generous in, in spirit and um, invites us to uh, rethink these uh, big comprehensive doctrines or, or uh, uh, civilizations or religions um, by offering a uh, really closely uh, crafted comparison uh, the inclination, if I might make another uh, wild comparison, um, is closer, however, to Francis Fukuyama in the sense that the book uh, seems to accept and move along uh, secularization theory and end of history model in which the modern nation state is um, does not even comment, does not even deserve comment uh, 
you know, the, the existence of the modern nation state, its, its uh, success and future, uh, it as, a, as an imminent reality is taken for granted. However, um, unlike old fashioned secularization theory in Professor Lawrence's book, secularization seems to need a lot of help from the clerical establishment. Um, religion must play its role in this process. It must accept its defeat. It must cope with its defeat. And it typically compensates for its loss of power, political power by expanding its ritual and social services, and that it ought to be allowed to do so. Okay, so it is these uh, later uh, recommendations that religion uh, in secularization process, which is inevitable, religion ought to be allowed to have a role by um, accepting its defeat and yet also um, uh, facilitating the task of the nation state. So in this respect, uh, the book uh, comes off as preeminently a pro status quo book. Um, as Professor Lawrence noted in passing that states that wield religion do so often with great violence. However, what I would have liked to see in the book and perhaps in his future research uh, is also to ask the question, which is the bigger problem? Is it independent Islam or authoritarianism? What's interesting is that he cites in one place uh, Rashid al Ghanushi saying that if you sow authoritarianism, you reap uh, ISIS or Daesh, right? But he doesn't follow that insight as much as I would have liked to see because the book seems to be mostly in conversation with the authoritarians and sympathetic to their point of view. Um, that they need to be authoritarian because Islam, of course, uh, poses a kind of threat um, and that deserves uh, perhaps uh, measures. Um, and although uh, in as, as uh, uh, some of the later chapters when he, um, when Professor Lawrence talks about his own preferences, it's very clear that he would like it to be constitutional democracy. Um, what is really interesting to me is that the civil society movements, the Islamic movements are seen almost always as the villain in the story. How could you have democracy, uh, even if that's what uh, you like without there being a robust civil society? So, uh, but then in my second part, of comments, I'll just focus here on a remarkable comparison that I think informs the book throughout, and that is between the military and the clerics. Um, and here there is a close comparison that Professor Lawrence draws with uh, Huntington's recommendation of how to deal with the military in three ways, by balancing them with civilian groups, by professionalizing them and making them politically sterile and neutral, and finally nationalizing them, transforming them from militias to large standing armies. This is a quote from page 40. Uh, the ulama or religious actors in Professor Lawrence's mind are fundamentally similar to armies and need to be similarly dealt with. To analogize, however, the army of clerics to the military, uh, is to postulate that religion and violence, in essence, are the same kind of problem as far as the nation state is concerned. Let's pursue this analogy further, although I understand that Professor Lawrence might uh, say that, well, it, this was all analogies are limited, and I would accept that. But let us pursue this as my interest in political philosophy uh, uh, was in fact really intrigued by, by this. So just as violence cannot be eliminated, so perhaps religion too is a condition of life that can be disciplined and weaponized, but not eliminated in human life. 
just as violence is used to discipline the people, defend against the enemy, and yet is a perpetual and ever-present threat that can get out of control, so can religion be similarly used. Religion, after all, is employed to discipline the masses, weaponized against the outside, against outside threat, but also often inside threat, uh, and yet is an ever-present a threat to the state itself, if allowed to be wielded by anyone other than the state, by independent ulama, for example, or mystics, or religious demagogues, um, perhaps religious celebrities. It poses the same kind of threat as unregulated militias due to the powers of, this, of the secular state. Just as the rise of modern democratic secular uh, democratic nation state required overcoming the problem of the monopoly of violence over politics, citizen control of the military, as it's often called. So it also requires um, states control of the army of ulama um, and their uh, students. Taliban would be an example. Literally, Taliban is religious students. Uh, secularism then is identical to peaceful order. Um, not only because secularism guarantees peace, but because the very meaning of secularism is peace. Um, accordingly, secularism is not to remove religion from the public sphere, but only and merely control it, just as the modern nation state claims total monopoly over violence, so must it wield total power over religion. The analogy, productive as it is, is also pr profoundly disruptive. It is a total rejection of the claims of American secularism, which uh, claimed, as the founding fathers often argued, to persuade religious leaders and even more, even most liberal politicians continue to use similar language to this day, which is the following. The separation of church, of state, church and state or disestablishment is there to protect religion from the interference by the state and only secondarily the other way around. Meaning the way you sell secularism to religious authorities as early Amer American founding fathers did was to say that it's good for religion. Imagine now arguing that disestablishment protects violence from the state, right? So you, you, if you replace violence uh, or religion uh, with violence, one could potentially think, of course, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms and hence to defensive violence as an example where the state does protect violence. But recall that in Professor's, Professor Lawrence's analogy, religion is not analogized to defensive legitimate violence but rather it is the uncontrolled ulama and religious preachers and revivalists that are likened to militias. Um, so American religion then cannot be analogized to violence. And, and I wondered why that is. Uh, perhaps because it has become modern, secular and non-disruptive. Islam, like early modern Catholicism before the second Vatican then is unreformed and in itself the exact same kind of problem as uncontrolled violence. Um, and some final point, um, coping with defeat and its recommendation that religion remain established in Muslim majority countries, not for the sake of religious integrity, religious critique of the state or the world, um, the religious end of salvation in this world or the next, and not because of Islam uh, itself have offering a law or ethics or politics that is worthy of protection, but because that is what is needed to establish the secular state, if I read the book correctly. Uh, secularism needs religion for its total victory. This is an eerie fulfillment of the critique that scholars of secularism like Talal Assad have presented, which is that secularism is not the separation of religion and politics, nor is it elimination of religion from governance and state. Rather, it is the control of religion by the state. The nation state is necessarily and inexorably secular, and yet, ironically, only the religious establishment, the clerics who control the religious urges of the masses, who can truly deliver secularism. 
disestablishment then is only possible when religion becomes intrinsically secular. As American sociologist Alan Wolf puts it in The Transformation of American Religion, the public need not be afraid of religion because American religion is now tame. Sermon, gone are the sermons about fire and brimstone, brimstone uh, sin and salvation. Um, and in our are the ideas of a friendly therapeutic God encouraging, in fact, to a sampling of various religious experiences like we experience cuisines. For secularism, religion does not order society, life or culture, let alone the political world. Rather, it adds flavor to a secular world whose problems, no matter how serious and apocalyptic, are now governed by capitalism and science uh, and not the logic or teachings of religion. For Muslims then, Islam is not the solution, but rather the problem. However, it is a problem that an army of nation state clerics, the ulama, uh, possibly on the payroll of uh, Muhammad bin Salman or Muhammad bin Zayed can help fix. So these are some thoughts that are generated by the book. They're not directly in the book. And um, uh, I, again, uh, thank you very much for writing a book that I know that I'll be thinking about for a long time. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Anjum. Um, so inshallah, we'll move on to the discussion portion of, uh, of, of the event now. But just before we do that, um, Professor Lawrence, I'm happy to give you a few minutes to uh, respond to a couple of the things that um, Dr. Larian and Dr. Anjum have, have raised. Uh, and then inshallah, we'll come to uh, our panelists and attendees. I can see some people have already got their, their hands up. But um, Professor Lawrence, go ahead. I'll, I'll give you a few minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you to, to both Dr. Al Aryan and Dr. Anjum for these truly thoughtful and, and insightful remarks. I was madly taking notes because uh, the ideas are very stimulating. Um, I will I will try to limit my responses because I'm I'm interested in hearing more from from the the group. Um, re regarding the, the first set of comments and the reality on the ground uh, for the kind of lived Islam, if you like, of um, either the subjects of uh, the Ottoman Empire or indeed Muslims around the world at the time, um, it was indeed still largely aspirational what the Ottomans were trying to do, but it was increasingly welcome the more of the Muslim world was occupied by Western powers. And so there was this kind of uh, fiction that was agreed upon in some cases uh, of continued loyalty to Ottoman Islam and to the Caliph, despite being under European rule. And this I describe in the book is the site of a lot of conflicts where the Europeans try to crack down and stop you know, the, the Friday prayer being dedicated to the wrong person. Um, and, and there are these so-called sort of kutbah controversies constantly. Um, the, the Ottoman state, however, did have a real footprint uh, in, in, throughout its empire uh, uh, before it lost those chunks uh, to France and, and Great Britain and the rest. Uh, and that infrastructure was growing uh, uh, fast uh, in the last 40 years of, uh, of the empire, last 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, that meant uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of Sharia court uh, uh, employees of various kinds. I list the sort of different kinds of employees uh, that you found increasingly on the ground. Uh, and they adapted to Hanafi uh, law. You know, they had no, the Ottomans were, were flexible. It's, it's true that it was a little bit more uh, perhaps like elite co-optation, but I would argue that that is true of what we consider to be centralized religions as well. Um, and so the, what I would say is that if you read the chapter on the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, a lot of what the Catholic church was trying to do was also similarly aspirational. They didn't really control all the priests and bishops on the ground. They were also largely picking winners uh, that already had legitimacy uh, for one reason or another, for familial reasons or, or reasons of wealth or, or, or connection, you know, any number of reasons. 
Um, and so part of what the Catholic Church did with the Counter-Reformation was begin to standardize, formalize, universalize, sort of globalize their reach. And that is exactly what the Ottomans were doing. And so I try to show that, that Abdul Hamid assembled this cabinet of sheikhs who had these specialties for different parts of the world. These guys were working hard. Some of them were publishing, you know, five books a month, uh, et cetera. So, um, so, so I believe that even where uh, the Ottomans were not, um, you know, always on the ground, there was either uh, a sort of hope or intention towards them, even if just to thumb one's, thumb one's nose at the colonial authorities. Um, and and these, fiction, these fictions were sometimes maintained through um, the obtention of, of, of literal permission from the caliph, even in uh, European occupied lands, for the local sheikhs or or rais to to essentially be uh, the chief you know legal representative of, of Islam in in the land, um, and and so these various movements that you mentioned uh, you know uh, Abdul Qadir is is a good example because the Ottomans were were helping him uh, you know the, the Ottomans were pursuing the pursuing their own anti French anti British uh, you know along with the Germans uh, uh, efforts to undermine colonial rule of Europeans. And so that also included allying with the Senussia uh, against the Italians and Libya, uh, allying um, with uh, uh, the, the, the Tariqat uh, in order to, um, uh, well, the Tariqat and the Sufis were, were the site of great um, uh, contention between the Europeans who tried to mobilize them against the Ottomans and vice versa. Um, so um, so I, I acknowledge the complexity here, but I, I don't think that it totally undermines the um, the the argument. Um, the uh, with regard to the flattening out of of radicals, and that's something that also came up in the second set of questions. I or, or you know sort of Islamists and the violent and the nonviolent. I I truly regret if that's the impression I gave because I've been spending years and years honestly trying to work against that that very conflation and that very flattening. Um, you know, my I came to this field uh, by studying uh, Muslims in Europe and and their kind of path to recognition as a religious community, uh, and so I'm I'm very familiar with the arguments uh, that you know of of Islamism leading to violence and you know inexorably, et cetera. I don't I've never I've never supported that um, that view, uh, and so when I um, you know. And this is something that comes comes up, I think, also in the second set of remarks. Sometimes I'm quoting um, officials, and I don't immediately insert my commentary because I, I, I don't know how relevant my commentary is. I'm I'm honestly trying to present these points of view so that we can now see what is actually being done. What what is going on? What do people think they're doing? You know, that's 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 why I think it's interesting to hear the words of the ministry officials, not because I agree with them. You know, I, I, I quote the, the 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 ministry officials from the 19th century talking about, you know, you have to guillotine the anarchists. I don't think you have to guillotine the anarchists. I think that's authoritarian and ridiculous. But, you know, it's still interesting to know what kind of institutional logic was being pursued at a given time. So in terms of. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to explain, I would say, and not trying to justify. That is my primary sort of modus throughout the book. Um, and, and so to, so to get to the, the, the second set of remarks very briefly, um, I also understand that they were, they're, they're meant to spark discussion. And, and, and so I appreciate the spirit of the contrapuntal spirit uh, very much. I like that phrase. I never heard it. Um, and, and, and you acknowledge that sometimes your reading might indeed be against the author's intention. I appreciate that uh, because some of your reading was indeed uninted unintended on, on my part. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not flattered by the analogy with Huntington. I'm, I'm, I appreciate his early, obviously this, the, the man is, is a pillar of the social sciences. He did a lot of important work. Um, and so I, I understand certainly um, you know, why it's, why I fall into this kind of Huntington Fukuyama discussion. I never considered myself really to be on either, on either side um, of, you know, that dispute, certainly. Uh, but it's true that I take the nation state as the, as the, as the given unit of international relations today, because I'm, again, trying to explain the world as it is. 
uh, and uh, I, I show how difficult the birth of the nation state was for Catholicism, right? I'm, I'm really trying not to single out Islam on purpose, right? Throughout, throughout, throughout. I, I, I very, very methodically uh, try to point out that these are institutional positions taken by uh, authorities in a position of defeat, <laughs> right? That they're losing something and they're fighting back, they're lashing out. Um, and, and so in terms of what's worse, you know, what, what's, which is worse, authoritarianism or independent Islam, I hope, I hope there's no doubt. <laughs> Uh, I, I hope you don't think that I'm endorsing authoritarianism. That's 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 really against that. That would be against my nature and, and against the point of of that I'm trying to make. Um, and and the point that I'm trying to make is that Catholicism also underwent this phase of being under authoritarian control of Catholic majority states, and uh, and the Catholic majority states absolutely suppressed every every sign of life in civil society. Uh, they they expelled the brotherhoods. They sometimes you know uh, did worse. Uh, they exiled people. Um, there was there was no room for independent um, Catholic life because that was a phase of state consolidation. I don't approve or disapprove. I'm just I'm I'm trying to describe what happened. Uh, and and during that phase of state consolidation, the the defeat of religion as an executive political force was sealed. That's my view. And that, it's, and that was, you know, the, the, the nation state has become so powerful that, that religious communities have simply had to accept the reality, just as every other civil society group has had to accept the reality that the state is the one with the monopoly on violence and the one who grants the permits around here, right? And so what I'm interested in isn't that phase. I'm interested in what comes next, what I call soft restoration. How does the religious community win back its autonomy in this reality of the, the world of nation states that we are in? And the way it does it is by, is by winning uh, sovereignty in areas where the nation state is happy to delegate, such as uh, education, charitable works. There's, you know, there's, a, there's a huge, you know, huge, huge nonprofit world area for governance for for in in our even in our nation states and so i'm interested in 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 how the the catholic um how the catholic church got there and the argument i make is twofold one is that you had to resolve the international status of catholicism you, 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 when the roman question was open when it was not certain whether the pope was his own man or not whether he could govern without the permission of some royal figure right when that question was unknown, where he would land, would he be expelled from Rome? He was just a prisoner in the Vatican for 59 years, right? And during that period, international Catholicism was wild. These guys sounded like, you know, like they were living in caves in Afghanistan. They were, they were anti-modernization. They were anti-democracy. They were, they were lashing out because they thought that they were on the verge of extinction. And that's what I argue what did happen <laughs> to Islam, that essentially this was, that, that was snuffed out. So the first argument is that you had to solve the international question. There were opportunities to do so for Islam. They were scuttled on purpose by, by self-interested actors. Um, the second aspect of this though, has to do also with this soft restoration and the accompanying devolution that comes with it. Because even in a highly centralized religion like Catholicism, the second critical moment is the creation of national hierarchies in Catholic countries or countries where you have Catholic communities. Because once you have self-governing national hierarchies, the room for democratization, for bottom-up influence, for the, everything from the nomination of bishops to who, who chooses the curriculum for the, for the school, all of this becomes filtered through essentially an acceptable interlocutor for nation states, but it's also an acceptable interlocutor for the religious community. And, and so these are, these are, are I, I tried to, to describe how this is taking place thanks to um, you know, dynamics of immigration in Europe, just like it took place thanks to dynamics of immigration towards the United States. But I don't uh, want to speak any further. Uh, I, um, I, I just want to uh, thank you, thank you both for, for your comments and I look forward to the rest of the, the, the discussion. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lawrence. Uh, it's the points you've raised, I think, are are interesting ones that will perhaps be reiterated now in the in the conversation. So I'm glad you 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 got a chance to um, highlight some of 
uh, and, and clarify some of those points there. Um, okay, just a reminder before we start as to the format of the of the discussion, perhaps for people who are attending for the first time. Uh, we have panelists and we have our public audience um, here with us today. So our panelists, feel free to raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and pose your questions or your comments directly. Uh, attendees, you can request to uh, be unmuted uh, by raising your hand as well, or you can submit your question in the designated Q&A box and we will read it out and pose it directly to Prof Professor Lawrence or Dr. Anjum, Dr. Larian, whoever um, the question is directed to. Um, for people who are posing their comments directly, please do try and keep it uh, to two minutes uh, maximum, your questions and comments, um, purely to avoid being cut off um, by myself. So um, hopefully as many people can contribute as possible. But we'll come first of all to um, Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal. You've, you've had your hand up for a long time. Thank you, Hannah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I would really request you to give me at least four minutes because I have really <laughs> enjoyed uh, this book and it pro provoked me to actually write a review, which I've just submitted to Muslim World Book Review, which is coming in the next issue. And because of the limitation of number of words for the book review, my book review was at least five times longer. So that's how much your book has been uh, of interest to me. And I really like the Islamic lemonade made from European lemons. <laughs> that was very delicious. Um, what I really want to do is very gently try to invite you to uh, objectively look at the lens through which you are looking at the entire situation. Obviously, political science, the, the discipline itself has, a, has its own lens to look at the world. Anthropology, religious studies similarly have their own lenses. But to recognize that when a storm comes in the sea, a political scientist would say, oh, look at the wind, it's causing the storm. An anthropologist would say, oh, no, 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 it's not the wind, look under the ocean hundreds of years of this and this is causing the storm. And the religious studies persons would look at the heavens and say, no, 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 it's coming from the heavens. <laughs> so there, is, there are limitations of the discipline. There is a limitations of the lens we wear. And I find that on top of all of that, there's a very strong Americanism in the lens through which you are looking at. And that Americanism is a control freak colonial legacy. And uh, so I would like to really uh, invite you to look at the historical and theological um, context of the current situation. You, as you said, you describe the world as it is, and you try to explain it, you try to understand it, but there is a history to it. Just now, for example, what you said about the Taliban being the foremost Sunni Islam trying to uh, emulate the caliphate, 40 million people. 40 million people are less than Istanbul and Karachi's population. <laughs> and Taliban are no more than high school students. And I find it really untenable that uh, Sunni Islam is not even defined in your book. Sunni Islam crystallized hundreds of years before the Ottomans. So what you are really describing is not Islam itself, not Sunni or Shia Islam, but rather manifestation of Islam, unfolding of Islam in various historical, political, geographical situations. So I would really invite you to look at the history of Islam itself and when Sunni Islam crystallized and how it was crystallized into the present four legal schools, there, there are many other, and the process through which this Islam crystallized. Did the state control it? Did the Abbasid control it? Did the Umayyads control it? And to what extent the Ottomans control it? The Islam itself, not the practice, by controlling the madrasas and Quran schools and education, what dent 
have they been able to put on Islam itself as opposed to the Roman Catholicism? This is a very fundamental flaw, I think, in the, in the whole structure of the book. And the second thing that I want to uh, highlight, of course, we can compare apples and bananas. They are both fruits. And uh, this half a sentence in the book that justifies or tries to justify this whole comparison, this huge building that is constructed on is just half a line that they both have creed and they both have rich rituals. Every single religion has creed and rituals. So we can actually uh, compare anything to anything. Uh, Thank you. Point B. Sorry, just if you could just historian. wrap up your last point. This if, is my if, last point. Yeah, point B uh, had forecasted that the final battle is going to be between Islam and the Western civilization long time before any of the Americans uh, thought so. And my submission to you is to look at the universalist claim of the nation state, which you just said that is the final de destiny and the claim of Islam to be the universal religion. The real problem is exactly between these two. And if seen from a different perspective, we'll get to a diff very different result. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Professor Lance. Thank you, thank you. It's very interesting to hear, um, to hear your reading. Um, I, don't, I don't recognize myself entirely in, in what you describe. Um, you know, I try to be interdisciplinary. Uh, it's obviously from the social sciences and the human sciences that I am that I am coming. Uh, but I, it's not a purely political science lens. You know, I, um, and and you know, I'm not saying that the nation state is the final destiny. I'm just saying that's where it is right now. It's where the world is right now. Where we're we're broken up into these nation states. There's nothing natural about that. There's a there's a reason, like you said, why and um uh and 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 given that that nation state has been modernizing centralizing and greedily uh taking control over you know every aspect of of life you know who what is the main like you said what is the main resistance it encounters well it encounters resistance from like-minded organizations that also want to uh, offer a, a rule book and uh, you know a, a way of living in 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 three dimensions right in all of the ways that that we exist whether it's in financial life or or, or social life or relationship to the environment etc Re religion offers this as well yes of course um, uh, and so that it's this conflict that I'm interested I'm not picking sides um, you know, I'm right now I'm a citizen, you know, my the sort of the most salient political reality for me is that I'm a citizen of this of the United States. That that's just how I how it how it is when I travel. That's what I notice. So whether or not people let me into their country is, you know, it's it's based on that. Um and so uh I would the, the comparison between the, the apples and bananas, you know, I, I like to think I spent more than a half sentence justifying the comparison. Um because there's more to it than just the rituals and and the creed um you know you you can find many christians many catholics who will tell you something very similar about the attempts of officialdom of the official church to control their spiritual lives and they'll say well that's just you know that's the institution of the church that's not my spiritual life they think they're controlling it because they run the seminaries and they have the school but my internal spiritual life is governed by something else. And, and indeed, you can see in the social behavior of Catholics, the, 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 the truth of that matter, that they don't, um, their, their aspects of their identity are determined by the way the Catholic Church has evolved to, uh, to, to govern prayer. And I would argue that aspects of Islamic life are still influenced by the way that the Ottomans sought to impose uh, a a useful infrastructure 
uh, for yes, their own um, political designs. There was something venal about it, of course, but they were also doing something they thought in service of the international religious community, and they were providing services that 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 people needed, and uh, they were doing so in a way that was not, um, you know, just in service of the European empires. Um, so anyway, thank you for your comments. Uh, Dr. Anjum or Professor Larian, would either of you like to come in on any of those points? Yeah, I think that um, I would like to say that the comparison with uh, with Catholicism, um, I too found it to be um, unprecedented. Because typically in the field of Islamic studies, the comparison is made with, in fact, Protestant Christianity. Like Islam is closer to Protestant Christianity in the sense that um, the role of the uh, role of papacy and papal institution, uh, especially as, as it came to be um, um, after the Carolingian Empire. You don't have anything like that in uh, Islam. And uh, I have argued in my work that this is not the case even at the height of the caliphal power, whether it's the Umayyads or the Abbasids. And so typically what Western social scientists and historians have done is that they, in fact, uh, like I, I believe Ernest Gellner says that this kind of uh, Islam is sort of an inverse of Christianity. So Shia Islam is similar to Catholicism and Sunni Islam is similar to Protestantism. And there is also some historical work on um, the links between uh, Ottoman influence and, uh, and, and Martin Luther, Lutheran uh, uh, revolution, if you will, or, or, or Protestant Reformation. Um, but that said, I also grant to Professor Lawrence that in the moments that he's studying, um, there is a heuristic comparison possible. Now, I think that there are moments in the book where it goes beyond that, because that comparison I think could be used. So all comparisons can be used to generate a new perspective, a new kind of data and comparison. And, uh, but sometimes they also uh, come with their own limitations. Um, and uh, I think that the difference between Catholicism, right, where uh, very doctrinally the role of papacy is, is something that modern Catholics can um, you know, try to wiggle out of, but that's a very modern phenomenon. You have, you know, you have more than a millennium and a half of tradition that pushes against uh, the idea that, you know, uh, you have a direct relationship to God, right? Whereas in Islam, uh, right from the beginning, uh, in fact, the Quran begins by critiquing this idea of intermediaries between God and human being. And uh, even though ulama establishments, uh, it, it you know does form, it's it's closer to Jewish rabbis, for instance. It always remains private. It always remains somewhat um, outside the state. In fact. Uh, in, in conflict with the state, in, in, in competition sometimes with the Abbasids, with the Umayyads, uh, even though there are certainly very important moments of, of collaboration. Uh, but so that's that's a comparison. I can see that there it, it, it is uh, it is one that is unprecedented. But at the end, after I re read the book, I should also acknowledge that I found it to be. Uh, not as unjustified uh, as Sheikh Muzaffar Iqbal uh, suggested. I think that it does uh, work in a limited sense in what uh, Professor Lawrence is trying to do to see a basic dynamic of what happens when a 
uh, global religion uh, loses political power? How does it react? And do Catholic, uh, does a Catholic institution and uh, the Ottomans who were admittedly uh, central in Muslim imagination only half a century or century before that moment. So they don't have anything, any history comparable to the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, they behave in some of the similar ways. They do increase their um, clerical armies, if you will, in order to make up for the political loss. And I think if that's the point he was trying to make, which, which is how I read the book, then I think uh, it is certainly an interesting and, and valid observation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anjum. Um, any other questions from our panelists? Uh, Ibrahim? Yes, thank you. Um, this is sort of a tangential question, just going off, uh, off you know, what I've heard today. Uh, from the professor. Uh, so, for, for example, you mentioned Afghanistan and you mentioned, you know, the, the Taliban basically, I don't think they call, call themselves the caliphate, but they basically do think, I think, they think of themselves as the only properly Islamic government in the world. And, um, um, you know, certainly, certainly the fact that they managed to, you know, defeat the United States and things like that, things like that sort of add to their appeal for um, a lot of Muslims. Uh, both inside Afghanistan and also outside, I think. Um, the, the, there's all, there's been uh, like for probably about twenty five years now. There's been a, the term that you also mentioned uh, when you were talking about Turkey about uh, Talibanization, which is um, it's a term that tends to mean either rel religious extremism or religious militancy or you know um, just militancy. Um, so. For example, um, when the, the, there were sort of some tribes that were uh, arming in Somalia, I think it was, and it was referred to as Talibanization, even though you know they didn't really have any other link to the Taliban. If you look at the Taliban within the within the context of Afghanistan, they were, if anything, they were more of a centralizing force. Uh, you know, they, they 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 disarmed a lot of militias. They came during a period when there was a lot of fragmented authority. They they tended to be more of a centralizing force compared to what they encountered uh, or what was there before them. So in that in that sense, they sort of resembled the state more. So my question was, do you think that this, this idea of Talibanization, which I think usually it bears very little resemblance to the Taliban themselves, do you think it's sort of because they are, they are perceived as being a, an alternative or a challenge or, you know, um, an, a, a sort of alternative paradigm to the dominant nation state model or, um, do you think that they're going to, that, that a government like the Taliban, similar to revolutionary Iran, they sort of became the establishment of Iran. So do you think something similar like that is going to happen with the Taliban and they basically take on the status of a state in the same way that, for example, the Saudi family did? Um, or do you think that it's going to sort of transform the religion state um, relations that, that are dominant uh, in most of the world? Thank you. Thank you for for the question. And um, so, I suppose one one aspect of this, um, you know, concerns the book's uh, interest in in what it actually takes to claim caliphal authority, right? Whether or not one actually names oneself caliph, or 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 speaks of a caliphate. I think the F, F, the Taliban speak of the Islamic Emirate, um, but the reality is that sovereignty for over over the the holy sites so there there are a number of there are a number of 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 aspects going into a claim of caliphal authority one is to be able to claim islamic rule at home right um and as sheikh mozafar iqbal um noted uh there is more than one claimant out there for uh those who would say that we are you know emulating uh, uh, the the rule of, of Islam and and the rule and the life of the Prophet correctly. Um, there are a couple of other um, states out there that that claim it. It's true. Um, you also, um, of course, um, the the 
the notion of military independence is, is I think, extremely important. It is something that has um, prevented, in a way, the, 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 the Saudi uh, authority from ever really taking root, um, in part, I believe, because they have relied upon um, the, the, the armies of, of non-Muslims in order to um, stay in place. Um, so I think of that as being somewhat um, you know, problematic. Um, there is, of course, the question of Qureshi descent. descent. I, you know, that's not a, a necessity, obviously, uh, uh, history shows. Um, and uh, uh, then there are more practical questions, right? And this is where the Taliban can't quite um, uh, play this role. One concerns uh, whether or not they um, can actually uh, support an international network of mosques um, or, or, or of, 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 of imams, of preachers of different kinds, and whether or not they have sovereignty over holy sites, right? And that's clearly something that is not um, in the immediate future uh, in terms of Islam's holiest sites. Uh, so um, ultimately, I would say uh, that uh, there are other countries that have uh, more of a claim right now towards fulfilling some of these um, uh, uh, roles. Um, and that the Taliban will be um, sort of guarded against, uh, in a sense, by those same countries that are seeking to fulfill many of those, those, very, um, those very roles in international Islam. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Lawrence. Um, in the absence of any other comments on that, we'll go to you, Man, and then we have uh, Sister Saba. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for this work and in general this discussion. Um, I would first like to just say, I, th I think I, I, I can very much understand the comparison with the Catholic Church, notwithstanding, of course, theological and various differences between Islam and Catholicism, to the extent that, at least prior to the Second Vatican Council, uh, the Catholic Church also sought some sort of institutional and political authority and influence um, across various geographical locations. So I think to that extent, the comparison is, is justified in my view. My question or my comment uh, that I'd like to get your thoughts on is more to do with the point about uh, describing the reality as it is. So, so I guess the, t the tensions or the, you sort of said that you're trying to describe how things were and how things are. So the work is predominantly descriptive and empirical. Um, uh, and, and, and that's in this discussion around the nation state and, and you know, can we, can we push back against the nation state? So on that point, I would, I would, I'd like to suggest that although the work predominantly does come across as descriptive, it still has normative elements. So for instance, clearly, uh, you know, authoritarianism is sort of a, a bad character in this field. Violence that can't be controlled is a, is part of the, uh, is a villain, um, understandably. Um, and to the extent that overall the argument of the book is sort of like, well, disestablishment might not be where we want to go, where we ought to go. So, so in other words, there are these underlying oughts that go beyond me description. And so in, with that in mind, first of all, is that a fair reading? And, and if so, with that in mind, can we revisit the question of the nation state as a given reality, right? If we're going to suggest certain oughts as better than other oughts, why can't we consider the idea that even though, yes, the nation state is a very dominant, very powerful reality, but why can't we consider it or why ought we not consider it along the same lines? It's authoritarianism, it's violence, and so on and so forth. Again, I'd, I'd uh, refer here to what Dr. Anjum said about Talal Assad's work, but obviously there's a lot, there's a vast literature now on, on, the authoritarian, on, the, on the violence of the nation state. So if the issue in the end, in one way, in the one sense, the issue you're getting at is, how do we minimize violence? How can religions sort of fit in in the given reality we have with minimizing violence? But I think that that also at least invites something 
uh, to be said about the violence of the of the nation state. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I'll pass it yes. On. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. So um, there are a couple of things at work here. So regarding the normative elements, um, it, it's it's true there is you know the kind of uh, bias uh, within the book towards what you know I would call the 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 rule of law and uh uh yes the, the the state monopoly over violence um uh and and there are certain there's a certain trajectory that i think is underlying uh the the main claims here and so if you were to have sort of spoken to catholics or to members of the catholic hierarchy uh during the analogous period of, of state control of religion, I have the feeling they would have sounded a lot like some of these questions, right? Which is, what are you talking about? How can you refer to Italy as a Catholic state when it's when when uh, its its rulers have prevented the church from operating on its territory, right? How can how can how how dare you, right? Um, and so I'm interested in what happens during that moment, because a lot happened uh, uh, for the church. The first thing to happen was actually the first Vatican Council. And the first Vatican Council was an absolute authoritarian <laughs> tirade against nascent, democratizing, nascent democratization, against the nation state order. Um, you know, every, all, there were so many ills of, of mod modernity that the popes had trouble choosing which ones to denounce um, as you got into the isms and, uh, and so on in, in the course of the 19th century. But the, so the first Vatican Council, what it, what it did was begin to say, all right, we are seriously going to have to standardize and make uniform what we are doing here because we are under assault everywhere by national governments. And so let's agree upon a plan, right? The, the account, a, a church council brings together, you know, thousands of church hierarchies. It's it's a very rare occasion, um, and so you know, a concrete plan for this nation state era that had finally arrived in Catholic Europe. It was no longer avoidable. Uh, and 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 the first attitude, as I say, was was absolutely uh, confrontational. Uh, and as the decades passed <laughs> and it became clear that the nation state wasn't going anywhere and that in fact many of those social economic forces had begun to actually weaken the place of religion in people's lives right this wasn't just a question of you know desire it was a new reality of of believers as well that, that the, the church was adapting to. Not because it wanted that, but it was, you know, again, it, it doesn't have to want any of these things in order to adapt to them. So when I say coping with defeat, I'm not saying, oh, yes, yes, good, good, uh, you must adapt. I'm saying, okay, how do, they, how do they deal with this defeat? How do they adapt? Um, and so the, the first Vatican Council attempts to standardize and, and improve the, 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 um, the strength of religion to resist nation state encroachment because you had the problem of nation states trying to pack the episcopate and trying to pack the cardinal college with their allies in order to ultimately produce a pope who was pliable to their wishes um, and so the church was attempting to resist this this is part of why it suspended the national hierarchies in a number of places um, but that period of of what you would call sort of a crossing the desert when the Pope was and, and the church had had lost its bearings, had lost, lost its status. Um, it happened to be the very moment when you had mass migration taking place uh, out of the Catholic world into uh, uh, the Americas, you know, North and South, elsewhere. And there was something about this immigration experience that altered the, the trajectory of the old hierarchy and its encounter with all of these modern challenges, all of these modern threats to their authority. Um, and I describe a, 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 you know, a, a complicated back and forth that, has, that, that, that goes through you know, 
a period of, of terrorism that I, I suggest is, is absolutely comparable to uh, the, the period of terrorism faced in the early 21st century in Europe. Uh, and, and I try to, to show how the church's response to a lack of control over the American situation was yes, to sort of clamp down and try and, and, and control more, but it couldn't anymore, right? Because the Catholics had become American. They didn't want the church to be governing their every move. They didn't want the papal envoy to be their representative uh, in the United States. They wanted to, to, to choose their own leaders. Now, um, that immigrant experience, right? That diaspora experience, I compare to other losses of authority. The ones that took place during the colonialism and then the ones that took place during the creation of the independent nation state itself. Uh, and what's interesting about this third phase is that it, it then feeds back upon the uh, sort of nervous system and, and the very brain of the religious community. Because uh, in, in, in the United States, Catholics were living as a minority, right? They had, they, they had, they started to pursue pluralism out of self-interest because they wanted to be able to practice their faith. Right? But a lot of these innovations, a lot of these dispensations, all of these adaptations couldn't just be contained in the immigrant diaspora. Because even in a highly centralized religion like Catholicism, there is feedback. And the feedback comes in the form of the bishops who form the episcopate, the, the cardinals who form the cardinal college. And all of this winds up feeding back in the second Vatican Council. Finally, essentially achieving this peaceful cohabitation with the modern state. And it is in a sense, a recognition of defeat, right? It's, it's, it's a recognition of defeat that you cannot say that yours is the only religion anymore. You cannot just ignore the other religions. Uh, you, you cannot you know, denounce uh, non-believers uh, you know, as, as, as uh, you know, damned, et cetera. You, you have to well, I mean, you, you can obviously do that in, in, uh, in, in your belief system, but um, a, a lot of the demonization, uh, all of the sort of uh, the, the difficulties of cohabitation were, were uh, reduced thanks to this Second Vatican Council, which was a meeting of the minds, including a lot of minds who had lived as a minority. Now, I try to show that the European diasporas form something like this process, albeit for still a period of national is, organ, or nationally organized Islams. Um, and so I try to show how the Council of Ulama, for example, that are operating under kind of Moroccan authority in Europe, they would love to just simply be the representatives of the king, right? But it's harder than that. It's harder than that because they're encountering real life, real life uh, people <laughs> who, who want to live their religious lives, right? And so they have to make adaptations. Their, their people need mortgages to buy their first house. Uh-oh, we're going to need a new ruling about, about mortgages, right? And you can try and contain that in the diaspora, but good luck, right? It, it, there's too much circulation of thought. There's, there's too much travel. There's too much information being circulated. Uh, and so uh, ultimately, uh, I, I believe that is the direction. You know, if we want to talk about what the ought is, I ultimately see uh, uh, these Islamic authorities, which are fractured and fragmented across, you know, two dozen or dozens of nation states, right? I ultimately see them as, you know, you can't sustain this kind of rigidity. You, you won't survive, literally. You, people will stop going to your, uh, your, your places and, and stop using your services and personnel. Um, and so there is a kind of necessary adaptation that takes place. Again, it's not about wanting it to take place. It's about coping with the new reality. Uh, and so um, to pretend, however, that Vatican II somehow resolved the issues would also be totally false because there have been continued rear guard actions against Vatican II, right? Francis is, is now the kind of the culmination of the Vatican II mindset but he's facing real resistance in American, in American dioceses, right? Not to mention African dioceses, right? Uh, real, real uh, resistance. So I could see the feedback mechanism leading somewhere else where I would less, be less normatively comfortable, right? But the process I'm describing would still be 
uh, would, would still correspond to, to, to what's happened. Uh, Dr. Al Haryan, I want to bring you in here. I don't know if you have any thoughts on Uthman's original question or perhaps some of the parallels that uh, Professor Lawrence has been talking about, if you see that um, happening uh, similarly in Islam as it did with Catholicism. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a fascinating question um, that Uthman posed. And I would, um, you know, think specifically, I mean, the, the person who keeps coming to mind is Wa'il Halaq and his book on the impossible state and thinking specifically about the incompatibility of a, of a you know, nation state project that seeks to kind of accommodate the traditional uh, vision of what an Islamic state looks like. And, and kind of also connecting to the previous question about the Taliban. I mean, I think one of the things we didn't hear about sort of why the Taliban doesn't qualify as a Khilafah is because ultimately it's a territorially bounded modern nation state, right? That's still, it's still one that kind of ha adopts more or less the same kinds of interpretations of being confined to a specific geography that doesn't make claims about the community of believers globally, that doesn't invite them to come and become citizens. In fact, the only citizens of that state are people who are sort of rooted there um, ethnically and, and historically. So there's something to be said about the fact that ultimately all of the projects that we're witnessing are ones that are not in any way um, you know, challenging the uh, the nation state order, and and in fact, even kind of the very basic definition of what what going back to to Dr. Lawrence's point about rule of law, I mean, the Islamic state as originally conceived has a completely different definition of what that rule of law uh, looks like. Um, right, it's about sovereignty of God first and foremost over you know the sovereignty of of kind of the logic of the state. It, it as Halak kind of argues, it carries its own logic that is very much. Um, incompatible with uh, any sort of reestablishment of, of a traditional Islamic state project. And so I think this is really where, where we ultimately see that these projects are at odds with one another. And, and what's suggested here in terms of the coping with defeat element of this is simply to find a way to kind of just carve out little niches that allow for things like the, the you know, day-to-day -day practice of religion. Whereas I think that the crisis that exists here, and maybe again, this is one that seems to have been resolved in the Catholic experience, but has not been resolved in the Sunni Muslim experience, is one in which there seems to be a, a, a widespread impulse among a certain number of uh, believers that kind of refuses to simply compartmentalize or create silos for their religious identity and to sort of sacrifice it at the altar of nationalism or the nation state, or even just a rule of law based order that is very much an arbitrary purview of specific, oftentimes authoritarian elites that are that are essentially creating this order and then kind of carving out pieces of it, parcels of it that are just part of their, their kind of ritual religious observance. And until we reconcile that, I, I don't see that this, you know, again, this crisis is going to be resolved. How it, it ultimately gets resolved as part of this battle of wills. But again, I don't see it as sort of you know, militants versus clerics or anything uh, along those lines. I think it's, it's really kind of something much deeper that goes to the core of societies, that goes to the core of fledgling national identities that we see kind of eroding daily in places like Iraq and, in, and you know, places like Syria and elsewhere, where you know, what does it mean today to be Lebanese or Syrian or Iraqi? I mean, are these nation state projects really sustainable? in any meaningful way? Or is there something really deeper that that we're kind of ignoring or burying? Um, so I guess I would just sort of pose, pose some of those thoughts. Definitely. Okay, we have a, a couple more hands. Um, Dr. Andrew, if you wanna comment on this point, feel free to come in and then we'll come back to uh, Sister Saba. I know she's, she's had a hand up for a while. No, I'll and let her go Jeff, first so. and then I'll come back. Yeah, okay, cool, that's fine, inshallah. All right, Sister um, Sister Saba, you should be able to pose your question now, John. Uh, Sister Saba, are you okay to unmute yourself? Did you want me to go ahead? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. In. Oh, in, in one second, Chef and Zafra, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Sister Saba. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I just... I want to add to what uh, Dr. Al Arian was saying uh, about the Taliban. Uh, I remember that there was a press conference in the late 1990s when Hezbollah first became operative, 
in Pakistan, and this is way before it was banned. Um, and during this press conference, uh, one of the journalists asked um, the leader of Hizbat Tahrir, why don't you join the Taliban? And, and do you have any plans of joining them? And they said, we, we actually contacted them and, uh, you know, to establish the Khilafat and the Taliban had absolutely no interest in doing so. Uh, and so we're, we're, we won't be collaborating with them because they don't have the, this design. And so I think that the, uh, that the word emirate in the, in the current government in Taliban is, is by design. They don't have at least if they're still following that same ideology, they don't have the same design, like they, they have the same design as they did prior to 9-11, which is not to establish the, the Khilafat. Thank you. Jazakallah khair for um, yeah, that point, inshallah. Okay, we have a few more hands. Um, uh, Dr. Anjum, do you want to, is, is your point related to that? I'm just trying to group similar, similar ideas, similar threads together. Um, I think, oh, if not, then we'll go to Shafan Zafar, but if, if it's related, then go ahead. Zakullah, I just take 30 seconds. I'm still struggling uh -huh. with the comparison uh, aspect and uh, just want to point out historically, uh, there is a huge difference between what happened with the Roman Catholics and what happened to Muslims. Uh, here in Canada, we just had a visit of the Pope and uh, in the background of uh, residential schools and the violence that they had done on the Aboriginal people. So the authority of the Catholic Church in areas as far as Canada here, compared to the authority of the Ottomans, there is absolutely no, no comparison. At the height of the Ottoman, Ottoman uh, rule, the, there were seven percent the literacy rate was 7% among men and 3% among women. And the villages held about 70% of the population where no one ever heard of what is happening in Istanbul. Same thing in India, uh, similar things in many other places in the Muslim world. So the rule of so-called Sunni Islam establishment was never like the Catholics. So that in at so many levels, I'm still struggling with the with the comparison. Exactly. I think it was changed. It was changing. The, 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 the comparison is not perfect. You, you'll never be fully satisfied because it's not perfect. But the uh, the it was changing in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. This is what I'm, I'm trying to provide evidence for. <laughs> I didn't say that it got there, but it was certainly on its way. And we will never know <laughs> how it would have turned out. Uh, that's that's but I want to hear from the, the the other two, please. Thank you. Okay. Um uh Dr. Andrew, go ahead and then we'll come to you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I wanted to prod uh Professor Lawrence to think more given um I, I want to especially draw on uh uh, uh Abdullah uh, Abdullah's comment about you know there is a sense of crisis in the world. And you, of course, acknowledge that it didn't go, um, you know, for, for reasons of colonial, uh, colonial uh, powers, uh, bias, or what have you. The Ottoman Empire perhaps wanted to be like the Catholic Church. It could never get there, and then it was dismantled. So the point is that the trajectories are different, right? Whether there was a moment of comparison, which I, I am willing to grant, we know that things are very different, number one. Uh, number two, um, the Catholic Church, like if you are a Muslim, right, you don't really look at Catholicism and say, aha, this is an example of thriving. In fact, Catholicism is the most left religion, most abandoned religion, which is surviving because of, and it, it, despite the fact that in terms of its establishment and it, the power of the church, which is the most um, um, among the richest organizations in the world, holds, holds more land than any other, uh, many governments do, and has enormous institutional power. Uh, no Muslim government has anything comparable today. 
Um, so the point is that things are different in both structurally today for, for Muslims and in their aspirations, they're very different, right? Muslims um, would like to be a little less abandoned uh, as a religion, right? Uh, so it, Catholicism is, is, is not the model. Uh, and secondly, or rather third point that, that sort of goes to that is that with these, you know, Catholics are, are living in the United States and, and, and North, Northern Europe uh, or, or in Europe. Uh, Muslims are living in failed states as, as Abdullah pointed out. Um, and, and, and add to that the fact that Christianity in fact is in one very relevant way different from Islam because Islam had an enormous experience throughout history starting with its texts, right? Uh, with, multi with religious plurality built into Islamic law in a way that uh, Christendom never did. So, uh, and I would draw your attention to um, uh, Michael Cook's book, Ancient Religion, Modern Politics, where he makes this argument, this extensive argument, which Shadi Hamid uh, re re recapitulates in his Islamic exceptionalism, and, and your, your colleague, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, with Shadi, um, that Islam is, and, but, but going back really more to Michael Cook's book, who makes a much more fine-grained argument, that the difference, and he, he makes the comparison between three religions, Islam, Catholic Christianity in particular, and Hinduism, right? And uh, makes this really detailed argument why in fundamental ways Islam is different. Um, and that Islam continues to pose a challenge, one could say it's vibrant because its concepts in Michael Cook's view, they look like modern concepts. They can be confused with modern concepts of freedom, of, of political equality, of the desire for a, for a state and number of things that other religions don't have. Um, now, of course, if you take into account Muslim theology and tradition, you get a far stronger version of that thesis. Um, so my point is that given that, right, the comparison allows us to shed light on a number of really interesting phenomena, but both in aspirations and structure and uh, I should say in doctrine, things are different. Um, Muslim states are falling apart and Muslims are not happy with their states the way that perhaps uh, uh, Catholics uh, uh, have reason to be in, in Europe and, and in America. Uh, their doctrine is different. So what now? Could you still recommend the same path? So, yes. so the, the comparison is really not being made between Catholics and Muslims today because the, the, the Catholic experience of what Muslims are going through today is, is not contemporary, right? And if you were to look at late 19th century Europe, it looked a lot like the Middle East, a lot like the Middle East. There were uh, nation states that were struggling to establish uniformity of the rule of law, struggling to do away with local languages, struggling to institute national education ministries, uh, struggling uh, in, 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 to, to keep control over population that was not allowed to participate politically and that thus sought out extremist, you know, so-called extremist movements, socialism, anarchism, you know, all these, all these ways to try. And so I, I, think, I think that the comparison is, is there if, if, you're willing, if, if you're willing to look back um, because the, the point really is, is subtler than, than I think it's coming across right now. Um, it, it has to do with what, what you and, and Dr. Al Arian were just um, observing uh, about the kind of unsatisfactory nature of the current nation state outcome, right? A lot of these national identities are weak. Um, and, and, and you say that there is not a kind of equivalent desire to, undo historical wrongs. But I would I I see the weakness of these states 
as well as the governance of Islam within the stronger states as processes that are necessary that will um, help with this uh, uh, kind of harmonization with, with existing national law, but it does not preclude that they would one day be unified again. Right, the, the Catholic Church, when it lost Northern Europe, it didn't just sit back and say, okay, well, that's done. It, it, it has struggled to reunify Christianity ever since, ever since. Uh, it created the Congregation of Propaganda Fide in, in the early 1600s to undo the loss of Northern Europe. And then of course, to spread Catholicism in, in the new world. Uh, and, 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 but um, so again, I would say like, we're not talking about finished processes here. We're talking about things that are, are, are fluid. And I don't, think the, I don't think that Catholicism has landed where it's going to wind up. I see where it's, I see where it's landed right now. And I think it's useful to understand these dynamics because it, it changes the way we think about these things. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a question in the Q&A that says, oh, am, you know, am I just sort of asking for an American view of religion? Why don't we become Americans? I don't, I don't understand the spirit of that question because this has nothing, I, I know I have an American accent, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in how people can live their religious lives as truthfully and as loyal as they, as they want to, given that we are now in the nation state era. And you know, a, another conversation would be about how to get beyond the nation state era. Um, you know, that's, that's a different conversation. I'm, I'm saying that you know, I've encountered, uh, you know, these aren't necessarily my best friends or whatever, but in, in the United States, I encounter religious people who lead deeply religious lives, right? Who, whose, whose lives are determined by what their, their rabbis or their priests tell them or their, you know, these, these people don't think that they're defeated or that they're, uh, you know, that they're not good Muslims or good Jews or good, they've, they've, you know, you might look at them and say, oh, they don't even realize how much they're suffering, but that's condescending. They, they, they have found place for their faith in their modern life. And and that's what I'm I'm interested in as the outcome, right? Not that everyone just suppress what they really want in the interest of state rule and control free. I'm not a control free. I'm 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 it's the opposite, right? I'm really trying to get to a place where people feel autonomous. And of course, we're not really autonomous. Of course, there's a state above us who's actually has always the last word. We know that from all realms of civil society, from all realms of our social and economic lives that the state has the last word. But that doesn't mean that we can't achieve freedoms within that, uh, within that framework, or, you know, or, if you, or maybe I'm you know, uh, just drunk the, the Kool-Aid. But I, I still believe that you can be a good citizen of a republic and a good Muslim, Jew, Christian. I, I, I truly believe that. And, um, and I don't think it's just about bowing or tipping your cap, you know, to the, to the man. I think it's a lot more uh, complex and, and, and possible to achieve that kind of autonomy. Um, and, uh, and, and that having a certain kind of conversation is necessary for that, for that to take place. Um, and so I think removing the, the you know, the, the notion that somehow religions are uniquely one way or another is, is a very important part of that. So, um, so that's part of what I'm trying to, to do with this book. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lawrence. Okay, we, we have gone slightly over time, but uh, Ibrahim, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give you kind of the last question or comment as it were, as long as you can keep it brief, uh, just one minute if, if that's okay with you. Yes, um, I was saying uh, somebody mentioned the question of uh, uh, emirate versus caliphate, for example, um, and I think if you look historically at most, uh, at most, uh, like even during the period of the caliphates, most local or you know most uh, temporal authority was wielded by emirates or sul sultanates, and you know the caliphate basically outsourced to them, or you know they basically acknowledged it, um, and. You know, in, in some cases, there were different emirates who were loyal to the same caliphate and they were fighting each other, things like that. So my, my question is, given, for example, the Taliban or or um, 
you know, Saudi Arabia or, or you know, different countries like that, you know, Pakistan and, you know, lots of different countries that, that you know, claim to be Islamic republics or Islamic emirates or whatever, Islamic kingdoms, given that, that they don't, um, that they don't claim authority over Muslims at large the way that the caliphate would, um, how much of a change would, I, I know that the state, the modern state is generally much more penetrative than, you know, in pre-modern areas, but how much change would you say that we have had from the, you know, the period of emirates that came during the period of the caliphate. Basically, how different are we now from when there was a caliph to whom everyone pledged, you know, sort of lip service or whatever, didn't really have local control. Now we still have local leader governments. They're much more penetrated, yes, but um, from a political standpoint or, you know, geopolitical standpoint, how different is it now that we don't have a caliphate? I, I just thought that might be an interesting question given that someone raised, you know, the question about Emirates versus Caliphates. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question to end on. Pastor Lawrence? Well, it's a bit, it's a bit beyond my expertise, but um, I, my, my sense is that uh, we are in this transitional period where you effectively do have Emirates or mini, you know, it doesn't make sense to speak of mini Caliphates, but you, you have essentially self-contained competing strains within the religion, right? And part of this is the, the legal schools that form the basis of, of, of the, you know, the four main uh, uh, legal schools uh, and just the limitations of any single authority and its ability to transcend its own legal school, right? That is, that is clearly its own, uh, uh, that is a, a, a kind of obstacle to unity in a sense. <laughs> Um, in addition to all of the nation state issues that, that, that we're, we're speaking of. But we do see an increasing globalization, transnationalization of this limited authority. And so I believe that this is part of the transitional phase uh, where you know, the Moroccan king is an, is a, is a, is an easy go-to example because it's so codified, you know, that he is you know, considered himself as the leader of Maliki Islam, and therefore, you know, that's not territorially bound. Um, and so, you know, you have that kind of state-friendly actor, obviously, um, who is seeking effectively the loyalty of, of a rather large number of followers. Um, and then you have the the non-state actors, you know, in 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 the realm of of you know all the way at the extremes of of, of Al Qaeda and, and ISIS, who who nonetheless have go through the trouble of trying to um, obtain baya from all of the relevant uh, constituencies for them. Right, they're still looking for some kind of legitimacy, um, uh, and they're looking to gather consensus. Right, and that was obviously a huge bone of contention between Al Qaeda and ISIS, precisely over whom, whom, who had already received the pledge of loyalty. Um, so, uh, so I, I see, uh, you know, the the Protest the, the continuing existence of the Protestant Church, the, and the continuing existence of the Catholic Church. Right, you have these, you know, you can't speak of Christianity, right? You have to, in 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 a, in a sense, you have to acknowledge that there are these separate branches and of course it's much goes well beyond those two branches um and i and i think uh that we have something similar to islam within islam today that doesn't mean there aren't actors in both worlds who think that the goal is ultimately doing away with all these differences right unity that's what the caliph you know said he was trying to do for whatever reasons he was the caliph of Shia and Sunni, right? This, this was, there was, a, there was a truly unifying agenda here. And the Pope today would probably acknowledge that Protestants don't recognize him, but he would still say, I'm their father. I'm, I'm their father, as, 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 you know, even though they're not tech. So I think that aspiration remains um, and, and, uh, and that satisfying, satisfying the, the dignity, the self-governing nature of, of faith in contemporary in this contemporary world of, of modern nation states is is critical for uh for the self-respect of citizens to to feel that they are able to be both people of faith and and you know loyal members of their polity whatever it is thank you professor lawrence um dr Anjum, your final final remarks 
Yeah, I'm, I must run to a class, but I just, before I did that, I wanted to acknowledge um, once again, the generosity of the book and how valuable it is. And uh, in particular, I want to more specifically say that uh, especially after talking to you, Professor Lawrence, I am persuaded of the value of the comparison that you make. Of course, your precedent for, for those of you who are familiar with Islamic tradition is the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, who said, in fact, that Muslims are going to follow uh, the Christians and the Jews. And even if they went and uh, hid in a lizard hole, the Muslims will do the same. So, of course, we shouldn't push back against the comparison because it is very much part of uh, our tradition to think, um, to think with and think through these comparisons. But more, 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 more uh, uh, to 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 your book, I think that the comparison that you make um, and, and is very is eminently helpful, even in in, in teaching and thinking, because it allows. Um, to allow students to see that Islam can be understood in mechanisms that are known, and it's not an exceptional uh, uh, religion in, in the sense of being exceptionally irrational or exceptionally different to uh, Western experience of belief and, um, and religious government and so on. So I think that in, in all of those respects, I want to thank you very much again um, and for enlightening us, for reading, uh, for writing a book that clearly is a, an ex is, is a result of a tremendous um, collection of data and experiences and conversations that uh, you have brought to us. Thank you very much. Um, I must run now, but uh, I hope that this is not the last time we'll host you here. Thank you very much to all of you for, for your attention and, and for taking the book seriously. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, to meet you and to speak with you. I hope, uh, I, hope I can stay in touch with some of you um, and I encourage you to, to send me an email um, uh, and uh, I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lawrence. We'd definitely, I'm sure, like to like to stay in touch. Um, thank you to all of our speakers today, um, Dr. Anjum and Dr. Ladian as well, and to everybody who participated in the conversation. Um, before we go, uh, just a reminder that if you haven't already, please do subscribe to our uh, our email newsletter on the Omadix Colloquium website to receive updates about our upcoming colloquiums uh, and news regarding the establishment of the Omadix Institute, which uh, is inshallah in the works. You can also uh, subscribe to our social media channels to again, keep getting updates about our new articles and, and events. Uh, until next time, uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, Assalamu alaikum and have a good day, afternoon or evening, wherever in the world you are.